Hello and welcome to day two of the snow and ice control webinar. My name is Paula Hyman, filling in for Victoria Beal from the Ohio LTAP Center. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items, same as yesterday. If you have questions throughout the presentation, put them in the questions box and our presenter will um, answer your questions um, at the end of the presentation today. Go ahead and locate that box um, from yesterday. Put a hello in there. Hi, it's Wednesday. We're halfway through the week. There are three documents in the download section available for you to download. If for some reason you're unable to download those handouts, put your email address in the questions box and I will email it to you. This webinar is being recorded and providing that the webinar uh, recording is successful, a YouTube link and the links to the documents will be made available to all participants and uploaded to our LTAP website. Thank you in advance for your participation and with that I'll pass things back off to Mr. Ron Osman. Ron. Thank you, Paula, and welcome back to the uh, second half of the presentation. Yesterday, we had a question about Apex C, and we've had Kimberly uh, Rosner out of District 2 send us some basic information on it. And it is a calcium chloride uh, formula added to the Meltdown line of products. So it is calcium chloride based. It's only about a penny more than the regular calcium chloride that we've bought in the past, and it doesn't clog up filters. Another thing is, is that they have proprietary additives that includes a, a corrosion prohibitor or protection, which is real important with calcium chloride. I don't know if you folks have used calcium chloride, but it will eat up a truck in no time. we have uh, I was shown a dump truck that had been in service for seven years and the frame had been rotten in two and they, they attributed that to calcium chloride as well as not being able to get the hopper out of the bed and clean the frames up. I know with District 7, they're inspecting the frames now and painting them every three years to prevent that type of thing from happening. But again, I'm seeing more and more ODOT districts getting away from calcium chloride and going to items that are more friendly to the environment and that. And this Apex C, they formulated it. So it is more environmentally uh, friendly as well as friendly to our equipment in that. So yesterday we covered about 44 slides and I have about 125 more to go through. So I'm gonna talk a little bit faster today. So Paul is gonna let me know when I'm about 50 minutes out to the end of the class and I'm gonna to switch to our very last segment on safety. So we'll see if I can get there before that 50 minute window occurs. So with this slide, this came out of Knox County and they were having issues with their augers jamming. And they came up with this idea of screening all the salt that goes into their single axle dump trucks. And they did that, they used an old truss bridge, welded it up and put the grate across the top. They said it worked out really good in preventing uh, clogs and jams in their auger system. Now at ODOT, I know we put a more powerful hydraulic motor on our auger system to grind up the chunks of salt in that. You know, we're still stuck with the hop mix and other stuff that gets uh, mixed in with the salt at the uh, plant or into the dump trucks that deliver it to us. You know, so we still got to get out and clean our auger jams up. So we were talking about loaders yesterday, and this one, uh, it was out on the road. They were using it for like a dirt haul job, and they didn't do a pre-trip. They just hopped in it, fired it right up, heard an unusual noise under the hood. And I don't know if you can see it on your screens, folks, but they got a cat in the fan. It climbed up in at the end of the, the shift to get warm between the uh, fan and the radiator. So it's real important we do our pre-trips, especially in the field or vehicles or outside. You never know what might crawl up and sleep underneath the hood. No, loaders, yep, they do roll over. We've rolled a number of them over over the years at ODOT. I've heard of one being rolled over in a salt bin. They were stacked and sold up for the winter and the side of the ramp gave out and over it went. Uh, we had another one uh, back when we had the old W14 loaders. I don't know if anyone still has those, but um, if you put the bucket all the way up and it's empty and you floor the uh, throttle and you do a sharp turn, it'll roll over on you. We've also had people uh, roll over. They've gone over the edge of like a stockpile and the bucket's high up in the air and they've rolled the unit over. So we have to be careful when operating loaders. Keep that bucket low except when loading. Make sure we're on a level ground when loading. 
the slide here shows that it's unlevel ground. You know, they were probably doing uh, ditch work, loading something into this dump truck, and these axles will pivot. You know, they'll pivot a little bit. So they lifted the bucket up, and when that center of gravity got too high, over the loader went. So keep that in mind when operating loaders. So our equipment out there, we're running single and tandem axle trucks. You know, we're we're putting $160,000 into a single axle truck, tandem axle truck. It starts in the $199,000. So plows, we, we tinker with plows, experiment trying to find the perfect plow for us to use. In the forefront of this picture, we have a C mold board with a, a snow flap on the front. In the background, you see a newer J model. And that also has the flap on the front to keep that blow by. Everybody's been blinded, I'm sure, by plowing snow and having all that fine dust uh, snow come over the front of the plow and just blind you. So we're looking for ways to minimize that. We even have snow come up between the bolts on our plows. And our solution was to put an L channel there to keep that snow from blowing up between the bolts. We've also gone to these carbide uh, blades. This is the Razor XL. There's a couple of different brands out there. And these units work wonderful with the counterbalance systems we have on all our trucks. I'm hearing we're on our fourth season in some of our counties uh, running interstate and that with these. And if you can imagine, we in District 7, we average two plow changes, plow blade changes a season. So in four years, that'd be eight changes. You know, if anybody's changed the plow blade, they know how messy it can be, how hazard it is. You know, we've had a number of injuries from dropping the plow blades on people's feet, on their chest. You know, if you're having to change it in the middle of a snow and ice event, you got to wash off the plow. You then have to climb under a wet plow, dripping everything on you. And it's just a whole lot better to have these carbide blades that are giving us, you know, four years of service. We're making our money, even though they might be, I think, around $1,600 a blade. So and this is just a jack I've seen out on my uh, trips out to do these classes that they use to pick the plow blades up. You know, before we went to the carbide sectional blades, we were mounting 11-foot, 12-foot blades, one piece up. And we had a number of injuries from that. And this is one of the solutions I've seen to lifting it. So and there's others. There's a lot of creative mechanics out there that have good solutions and make it a safer environment for everyone out on the roadway. Tire chains. Good old days. You know, we'd have an ice storm out there. We'd have to come back to the shop and put a set of tire chains on our rear axle. Then they go back out on the road. You know, we have a lot of our dump trucks equipped with these air actuated throw under tire chains. They work real good out there. I mean, they're there on demand, so we don't have to go back to the shop. You know, they work real good at about five mile an hour when they really start working good. And I understand they rip off the truck at about 20 mile an hour. So they do have restricted operating uh, range. Recommend that you cycle these on a regular basis to make sure they function, make sure they're well lubricated. They said if they aren't used on a regular basis, uh, they can freeze up in position. Uh, I had one of the townships that had these say, that they don't work good in deep snow. They went out on the road without a plow on, foot or so deep snow, probably to pull another truck out of the ditch. And they said they really didn't work very well. Uh, but it's a good solution to, to not being able to put chains in that. On our trucks, we gotta have fenders over our rear axle. I've heard some of that is federal motor carrier regulations. We have to have a fender over uh, the rear tires. Another one is it's part of our corrosion prevention program where we're preventing all the slop from the roads and that hitting the underside of the bed, getting into all the nooks and crannies, and then corroding the truck up. So we don't have a good way to put the old style um, chains on. So this is a good solution to that problem. LED plow lights. They're wonderful. They're a lot more brighter. I hope you can see in your image they're heated because everybody knows with LED lights, they don't put enough heat out that they melt the snow off. So real nice addition, and they come from the factory this way, where the good old days, we'd have to fabricate a bracket and then put uh, a headlight on it. And usually it was like a farm tractor headlight or something 
that we'd have to come up with to actually have plow lights on our truck. So this is real nice to have these from the factory. And then heated windshield. I know everybody that's had snow blow up on your windshield, it always collects at the bottom and on the right-hand side of the windshield as we throw the snow off the right-hand side of the plow. And having these heat coils in there, it helps melt that off. We don't have that problem. We don't have to stop every couple of miles and clean our windshields off. So it's a real nice feature in our trucks. That is a heated footrest. You know, slips and falls are considered the number one uh, injury out there on the road. You know, everybody's plowed snow and we've had the steps you climb into the truck with ice over. And this is our prevention, our solution to preventing those slips and falls. Uh, I understand you can get retrofit kits and retrofit older dump trucks with this. It's basically a heater line. They pull it off the heater hoses into the steps of the truck and heats it up. It's, it's just a bolt on uh, heat exchanger, warms up those steps, melts all the ice in that off. It's a real nice feature. Something else we're playing with are these air dams across the back of the trucks. Catches air as we drive down the road, forces air down across the back of the truck, and it um, it, it blows the air. It keeps the uh, snow on that from accumulating on the back, keeps reflective panels clear, and the lights in that on our truck. And again, they're all LED, so they don't get warm enough to melt off the snow on that. So wing plows, we've got a lot of wing plows. I don't know what the numbers are, if it's like a half the fleet, whatever, but this is pretty much done away with greater use out there in the counties. District seven, we had eight counties, and I think we had nine or 10 graders, and they're now down to three graders as a result of going the wing plows. So they're a great addition, being able to plow out through the ditch line, uh, I've seen real good operators with wings and the ground is frozen, go almost out to the right away in really bad areas to clean out uh, the snow, to get the drifts in that pushed back. And again, in our fleets, I know District 7's done it, I don't know if it's statewide, but they've gone to a 50-50 blend. Uh, dark, this is a dark county uh, garage, and when I worked there, we never had a tandem axle there. We had all single axle, and now half the fleet there is tandem. Part of the idea is that the, the truck frames are heavier, they hold up better, they have more accessories on the tandem axles than we do on the single axles. So there's a lot of good benefits on going to the uh, tandem axle trucks out there. So, and when we're not using the wing plow, we've got stands that roll around the garage so we can take them off and store them. Belly blades. Uh, Brand new one there at Dark County, and a number of our garages have them. They work like a grater blade. They're really good for ice pack where we can peel it off the roadways. And that we've got some uh, operators that really like them because they don't use their front plows because they have all that blowback coming up on the windshield. They just use their belly blades uh, to get the smaller snowstorms and that cleaned up. So it works out real good. One of the disadvantages is this plow blade is all the way up, has about is a clearance. So during the summer months, they've made carts to remove these. So we get about a foot clearance because you can imagine what had happened if you're doing a dirt haul or something, you pull off the road, you know, your right side sinks a little bit, you know, you hang up on the belly blade. How do you get it unstuck? So that's one of the disadvantages of having the belly blade on your truck. Roll-offs. I know District 7 is trying to get two roll-offs per county in the district because it's a better return on investment. Again, they can get four different beds for these trucks. We see the snow and ice hopper bed in here. You can put a tanker bed on there. You can put a flat bed on it. And then um, what was the fourth one? There's a fourth one that you can put on these. And then uh, it, you just get a better return on your investment by using one frame to do four different jobs. So backside of this roll off, and it shows you it has a wing plow on it as well. And then note the saddle tanks uh, along the sides of the hopper. These are an older style saddle tank, and I don't know what the gallon capacity is for pre-wetting in that, but our next slide will show us a newer hopper, and look how far up the tanks go. So this is like 1,000, 1,200 gallons worth of liquid. 
Notice the spray bar on the back of this insert hopper, and they actually do anti-icing or pre-treating with this truck out on the roadway. So insert 1,000 gallon, 1,200 gallon tanker for the single axle dump trucks. If you note the spray bars, they spray three different lanes with this one truck. You know, left, right, they use this type spray bar to spray the drifts in that, the blowing snow to try to get it from blowing on the road. And they can uh, go in and try to clean up the mess from the blowing snow and hopefully it'll blow across, it'll freeze dry and then blow across the roadway. And this is a roll off with a 2000 plus gallon tank on the back. Again, very versatile with the roll offs. So, Real nice setup. This is Montgomery County's roll off. And then again at Montgomery County, Montgomery County has 70 and 75 interstate there. There's two 5,000 gallon tankers in their fleet. I know Preble County has some, and I don't know if the Lions Road, which is still part of Montgomery County, if they also have a couple of tankers down there. So lessons learned with the tankers is that uh, we buy them used rather than news, new because it's half the cost that we were doing gravity flow uh, mechanisms on these. They flip them on and off, and they learned they can fit these semis with a front-mounted pump, and they're now going to regulate the amount of uh, blended material we're putting down on the interstate system. The spray bar attachment on the back is now a fabricated part that'll attach to about any tanker out in the fleet. I'll have contact information at the end with Dwayne Byers, and he's helped fabricate and design this. So anybody that wants to attach one to a tanker calls them up, they call the shop, they fabricate it, and they ship it out to the district that is needed. Another thing is we learned to fill from the bottom of these tanks and not from the top. If you fill from the top, let it free fall down in, it has a tendency of foaming up. And if it foams, you end up with these big foam tumbleweeds going across your yard. So if you fill at the bottom so it buries the fill pipe under the liquid, it doesn't foam up. So it's a real nice addition. Again, we do two hour rounds with these tankers, you know, keeping our roadways and that clear. So again, we still use spreader units out there. We've got a couple of different versions of them. So we see the insert hopper here with a tandem. We see the first generation uh, tailgate with a pre-wetting tank on the back of it. And then we see the next generation, which has the pre-wetting tank between the cab and the bed. And the headache rack is now fixed. And then we have uh, the bed of the truck. Now you see that bed of a truck has a lot of salt. We usually put about eight tons in it. I think we can go to 10 tons with the newer trucks. How much weight do you think we got on the rear axle? Well, someplace in the state we had an accident, bed was up like that. Some attorney figured out that with our older trucks that we were overloading the rear axle. So we were not legally allowed to be on the road unless we were properly permitted. They also found out we were running 11 foot plow blades on these single axle, 12 foot on the tandem, and you have to be permitted anything over 10 foot six. So they actually had to rewrite the higher revised code and it's called the diminishing load clause in there. So the one more on snow and ice operations, we can be overloaded and over width, over dimensional and overweight, I think is the terminology. So, and as long as we have our strobe lights and that on, you know, we're covered under that clause. So you see our trucks when we're doing summer work and that, we have a snow plow blade on, we always run the strobe lights on. Another thing ODOT did is they beefed up their trucks. If you look at like the older generation trucks and the newer generation, we have stronger frames, stronger axles, and that so we can actually handle the bed up on the rear axle, the load on it, due to the beefing up of the trucks are rated for that load now. Another side benefit they've seen is longevity of the equipment. It's not being beat up as bad since it's a, a beefier, a heavier duty truck out there on the roadway. So it's another tailgate we have. It's a rock gate that has a spinner box underneath and it has twin spinners. And these are really nice, especially if you have elevated curves in that, you can treat the high side without having to drive the truck off the side of the road so your left spinner is treating there. You know, or drive against traffic trying to get the high side. And then during the summer, these are wonderful for spot berming 
because you take the spinners off, you put a chute on the right hand side, and you just roll berm right off into the ditch line. You follow up with a dump truck with a snow plow on, and they strike it off. And it's a moving operation. You can get more production, better return on investment with uh, doing this operation, doing the uh, berming operation. So it's a real nice addition. And this is the latest and greatest. This is the first slide I've seen of this. Dwayne gave this to me. And we're now playing around with center mounted um, uh, chutes on our single axle dump trucks because they're trying to get a little bit better use of material net rather than that left hand side. And this truck apparently has enough brine capacity that they can use it for anti icing and de icing. And if you notice, we have tubes on the back that go down to the pavement when it's fully loaded to minimize aerialization of our product. Because again, we're not putting it into the environment and we want the product to stay on the roadway. So some of our trucks, you know, our insert hoppers, we have the spinners on the center back. Some of them, I know up in the Cleveland area, we've got, uh, I think they call them flow bodies where they have a conveyor belt in the middle of the bed. And then they have to have the spinner they put on and, and take off during the summer months. So on the right hand photo, that's one of those flow bodies and you can remove that spinner setup. And on the left hand side, I think that's an insert. And another thing to notice is the veins on the spinners. You got one with a, a clef on the top and people feel that throws material better than just a straight blade on it. So a couple of different spinners we're using out there. And then this is the cart when we don't need that center spinner, we just put it on a cart, roll it off into the uh, corner of the shop. So another one of the insert hoppers, and I included this because it's the only one I've seen with twin spinners. They got a right hand spinner. They've put a sign plate there to keep the salt from going out into the ditch line when they're treating the high side of an elevated curve in that. So I thought it was a real good addition to the insert hoppers. And then here's our tailgate mounted brine tank. When we first got into pre-wetting at the spinner, this is how we did it. We retrofitted all our spinners with these tailgates, uh, spinner packs, and were able to pre-wet. Some of the disadvantages of having it mounted on the tailgate is we're adding a, an awful lot of weight to our tailgate. It puts it out of balance. It used to set level. We have a couple of brackets on the bottom. We have a, a lift hook and you could lift it straight up. If you notice, there's a cushion block down underneath that just to keep it from falling over backwards. And we learned we had to have the tanks empty just to take the gates off the back of the trucks. We had a number of injuries as a result of this. I know we went to getting uh, grain hit trailers. I think most of you are familiar with the farmers. They take the, the head off their combine and pull it down the road. And we bought some of those and made uh, tailgate racks out of them. So we just took them straight off the truck, put them right in the tailgate rack, so we didn't have to bother with them. You know, otherwise they'd sit on the ground or we used to hang them right behind the trucks on a uh, rolling, uh, oh, rolling chain hoist. So and it really helped us out going to those uh, grain head trailers for our spinners and that, because we could actually dry them. Every year these get painted at district, so we could just, pull them down the road, go in the district, so we didn't have to handle them. Less risk of injuries than that. So it was a real nice solution to the problem. So and here's our new version, our mid-frame brine tanks. The first generation is on the left. The new generation is on the right. The left one was 80 gallons. The new ones, I'm hearing 120 gallons. And I've heard they're retrofitting the older trucks of these newer ones so they can put more liquid down. So and this is something I want everybody to be aware of. The Department of Administrative Services uh, writes all the administrative code for the state agencies throughout the state. And they have a co-op program where any municipality can join and they can buy products usually at a cost savings, you know, 10% or so. You'll have to get a hold of Tanya Prickett for all the different information. Her phone number is here and her email address is here. So they're saying about 1,500 municipalities belong out of a potential 3,000 municipalities in Ohio. So it's a nice program in that. Recommend you check into it to see if you can save uh, 
on your budget on buying uh, bulk items and that. And then, of course, ODOT has a co-op program, totally separate from the uh, DAS program. And this is not your uh, buy salt uh, contract in bulk. And I don't think this includes buying equipment from ODOT as well. If you get a hold of your districts, you can get more information from them on uh, you know buying things that they're surplusing and uh, equipment things like that and i don't know if jim here can help you out but this is his contact number jim church is the point of contact i know jim had some medical issues and was out and they gave us robert rounds as the backup so and it has a list of everything that's on contract you know i don't know if this apex c is part of that contract to where you can buy that at uh, ODOT cost, what we pay for it and that, but this is something good to know and have on hand. So, okay, here's our assessive blade wear. Again, for our carbide blades and that, they actually have a wear mark on them and when they get down there, we replace them. But our traditional blades and that, we are always told two fingers. If we don't have two fingers worth of uh, meat on our blade, we don't go out on the road, we replace them. We get down to that two fingers, we have to monitor to make sure we're ready to replace it. And this slide, somebody wasn't paying attention and it got into the bottom trip of our plow and we have to replace that bottom trip on this. There's not enough meat there to save. It's a $900 piece of equipment there they had to replace. And when there's four trip springs under there, and it's it can be a challenge to get those trip springs uh, off the unit and then back on and properly tensioned. I know some of our first generation bottom trip plows we received, uh, they were not properly tensioned and the bottom would trip every time you dropped the plow. So there's some techniques there. And the reason we want the bottom trip plows is safety. Again, those people out there, they have full moldboard trips. You understand what happens when you're moldboard trips. When I first learned how to plow, they told me the first thing I do is take a log chain, wrap it around the moldboard because the whole moldboard trips. Because if it trips, you lose control of your vehicle and you get into an accident. You know, we're running 1,600 plows out there. So we have our share of accidents. You know, it's just the nature of the beast when it comes to snow and ice. So to reduce our risk of accidents, we put the bottom trips down. So it's a real nice addition to have out there. Something to think about when you're replacing your plows and that and go to the bottom trip. So with our bottom trip plows, they're now self-leveling. Remember earlier I talked about how our old style plows, you pick them up and they'd settle to the heavy side. And now we've got a self-leveling mechanism that you pick it up and it'll stay level no matter what angle you have the plow out. And this is part of that leveling mechanism. And they lost the bolt and it shifted. It's now under, you can see the hydraulic cylinder and it's now under the center. It shouldn't be, I think our next slide shows where it came out of. And again, it's something to be aware of. And you can see the on the left side of this slide that it's a plow shoe and it's missing the plow shoe, which is sort of the norm with these old style plow shoes. You know, they were a blessing out there on the roadway to prevent from going down into the uh, expansion joints and that, but they were detrimental. They became a projectile when the uh, threaded rod up through there would strip out and that mushroom at the bottom would come out and we've punched it through our oil pans, through tires, the traveling public, you know, we've bounced it into their vehicles. I saw a photo at one time, one embedded in the hood of a car. So they have that secondary uh, hazard out there. We ended up welding chains to the uh, mushroom and then had a clevis up on the turntable part of the plow. So if it did come off, then uh, we could at least pick it up, it drag it down the road and then pick it up and throw it in the cab of the truck, and take it back to the shop. So nowadays we've gone to counterbalances. You know, all our hydraulic uh, control systems, they come from the factory with it. We retrofitted a number of our equipment uh, before we had that system with manual spring-loaded uh, counterbalance systems. Those counterbalance systems are wonderful in that you can set them to put a thousand pounds of down pressure on the blade. ODOT is set at 500 pounds of down pressure. So again, that's part of the reason we're getting four years of service life out of a carbide blade. We aren't putting the full weight of the plow down on it. The other thing is with counterbalances in that we don't have to have the plow shoes on them, which eliminates the safety hazard 
that the mushrooms on the bottom uh, have, plus they're around $100 a piece, so we're saving $200 per plow by not having the plow shoes on them. We've gone to a basic tractor and supply jack stand just to keep the plow up in the shop so we don't have to fiddle around with a, a floor jack trying to get the plow to mount into the truck. You know, we're using quick couple push units. They're very nice. You know, you have the height set up and you just pull in and then you lock the plow on, hook up your cables and you're off and running. So you can buy retrofit kits of these counterweight systems. ODOT was paying, I want to say around $800 a set to retrofit a number of their plows um, out there with these kits. So if you don't have it, you can look at contacting a, a company. I think we use um, Dresser, is it Dresser or Galleon uh, plows? I think that's what it is. My memory's not the best on that. And we bought the kits from them. So again, I've talked about the counterbalances. Again, most of our units, they're on when they come from the factory. The good old days, they were off and we had to turn them on. So, and again, I've talked about all this. So our controllers and our cabs and that, you know, we have all computer controlled units. You know, when I first started in 81, we used to have manual controls. So again, the idea of going to computer controls is that we can control the material out there on the roadway, you know, that's calibrated correctly and that we know how much material is going down. For the good old days, it was as long as I put a load of material down on each round, they were happy. And again, that's part of material control, keeping our cost in that down. Less fatigue on the operators because you have a lot of electronics backing you up. Uh, most of our equipment has Penguin units. They're made here in Ohio. And of course, ODOT has a mandate that we buy Ohio first. So Penguins are considered the Cadillacs out there of your snow and ice equipment. Uh, we'll look at a couple of other units here in a minute, but um, they're real easy to use. If you look at this controller, we have three different plows we're, we're controlling. It has an underbelly, it has a front plow, and it has a wing plow. And they're controlled up, down, left, and right just by those little cursors at the top. So it's a very nice setup. And this is the latest and greatest version of the Penguin units that we're using. Again, a joystick, the, the raise and lower the bed, and the one plow, and I'd assume they have a couple of more joysticks on the top or cursors to run additional units. Force America is another unit that we use out there. Um, they're a very good unit, and a lot of people like these. Uh, they have an armrest there, and then uh, they're more ergonomically uh, set up for our trucks, so people don't have the level of fatigue, a touch screen there and everything's right there at your fingertips to run this. I don't have a slide of the Monroe units. Uh, this is like the second year we've gone to those, and I haven't found the truck with the unit installed, but they're made, not Monroe, it's Muncie. Muncie, because they're made in Muncie, Indiana, and the Indiana DOT runs all Muncie equipment in theirs. So, and I understand they're a good piece of equipment out there, and those are the three primary controllers we have in ODOT fleet. Now, what I'm seeing out in the townships in that are these freedom controls. The left one is Knox County. Uh, this was one of two units they fitted out into their trucks uh, two years ago, three years ago now. And I was told last year they fitted out their entire fleet with these units. They really like them. Uh, it's a good entry level unit for uh, township, county, and city organizations. The right-hand unit is out of the city of Sandusky. Again, it's the same unit with a little bit different configuration uh, due to their operating needs. It might even be a little bit older unit than what the Knox County unit is. So, and in Knox County, I really like this. I've seen this in several um, places. I've done classes, but they've got a notebook that goes in every single truck, and it has all the routes where they go, where to turn around that. Uh, if there's special considerations, they have to watch out for, you know, it might be um, catch basins or something else out there. And this slide's open to the uh, 
Freedom Controller because it was the first time Knox County had them, so they had instruction manuals on how to operate them in case the regular driver wasn't able to work that day. So, and it's a real good thing to do. One of our stories out of Dark County is we got a state route that goes out to the state line, Indiana State Line 502, and we had a spare. We had a guy come out of district, real bad snowstorm. We needed more plow operators, put him in a truck, told him to go out 502, go run it. And he gets out there and he calls in on the state radio. Hey, where do I turn around that? And the guy running the radio says, where you at? And he said, Bartoni. And you could hear the radio operator, our base station uh, key up. And he started laughing. And I think all of us were laughing because we know Bartoni's two miles into Indiana. You know, no one bothered to tell him to turn around the state line. So it was a real good idea to have a list of where you turn around and what your routes are out there on your roadways. The calibration is very important. So we got a couple of things. Let's see if they pop up. Yep, they're not popping up. Okay, did I hit the wrong button? So I bet I hit, there they are. Like I said, it's only my second day using this system. So it's a real nice setup in that. I'm just trying to get used to it. <laughs> so anyway, calibration, you know, Everything needs to be calibrated yearly. You know, they recommend some manufacturers and that recommend twice a year. If you're using any sort of aggregate like uh, number nine ice grits, you really need to do it twice a year because your auger tines will wear down. You know, our county, we used to run a 50-50 mix, 50% salt, 50% grits. And it seems like every year they were replacing one auger out of the entire fleet of our snow and ice trucks because the tines on the auger had ground down to nothing. It wasn't putting material out. You know, another thing mechanics say is they monitor how much material is being used throughout a snow and ice event. And if they see there's too much fluctuation between operators, they'll go in and calibrate. You know, if they do any major maintenance, replace a hydraulic motor someplace or do any work on the hydraulic system, they'll calibrate it because they want to make sure that what we're putting down on the road is what the computer is saying we're putting down. So with the uh, poster here, the calibration kid, this is an example and it was done a few years ago, but it shows that if we have 5% uh, is off on a truck that apply 225 tons of salt per year, we'll waste about 11.25 tons. And back then, salt was $63 a ton. So that comes out to $708 per truck per season that we're wasting. And if we had 900 trucks out of our 1600 truck fleet off by 5%, $637,800 worth of wasted salt. That's a lot of money. If that same fleet of trucks was off by 10%, that doubles $1.2 million. So that emphasizes how important it is for us to calibrate our equipment to make sure it's put the right amount of uh, material out on our roadways. So, and using the automatic controls to make sure we are putting that out there. So roadway information, again, our weather information systems are very important out there. So we get a feel for what's going on with the, with the weather out there. You know, they're showing if we put money into a, a value added or a outside uh, source for weather, and a lot of these are uh, geared towards snow and ice events, for every dollar we put into it, we can see as little as $1.25 come back off of it or up to six eighty five dollars come back off of it. And again, they're giving us weather forecasts that are less than 24 hours old. So it, it's real time information that we have out there on our weather forecast. Now this is ODOT's DTN system. And it's a real nice system. You guys go to the county garages. I'm sure they'll give you a tour of it. There's menu bars on the left and they'll give you an hour by hour summation of what they think is gonna happen with the storm. You know, so you can plan your snow and ice fighting techniques for the storm. You know, you can look at temperatures, you know, if they're coming up, you don't have to put as much material down, especially towards the end of the event. Uh, it'll give you actually rate applications, and I, um, which means like 50 pounds a lane mile, 200 pounds a lane mile. They'll actually project what you need uh, during each hour of the event to be able to, uh, you know, save on material usage. And then we have uh, real-time access to a meteorologist that'll sit down and look at our affected area where we're at, if it's Dark County or whatever county you're in, 
and they'll give you a projected uh, uh, weather forecast for that area so you can plan your snow fighting techniques for that storm. Again, everything's getting real technical out there with uh, snow fighting. So let's see, I'm ready for a cough drop here. Let me pop that in. And next here, roadway information. We're the number one state in the country. We got 170 of these things out there. And actually the DTN weather stations and that pull a lot of their data off of our sites out there on the roadway. Again, it's a wireless system that feeds all this information in, so they get real-time information on these. So we're going to go over some of the features out there. You know, it gives air temperature, dew point, relative humidity, precipitation type, wind direction, speed, pavement temperature, pavement condition, traffic speed, and volumes. So dew point and air temperature is important to know because you get within five degrees of the air temperature out there. You're going to have moisture. You're going to have the moisture come out of the air and condense to the pavements in that. If we have pavement temperatures, we get within three degrees of that D point. We're going to have something form on the pavement, and that could be black ice and that. So a lot of good information here. We're going to go through the Ohio Go system. They have a cell phone app. You can load it and have it with you all the time. Real good information with this. We're going to go over each of the slides here or uh, each of the stations here. And Ron, just a quick second, just wanted to let yeah. you know that uh, you it's 1041. You wanted me to let you know. Oh, wow. So, okay, I've got to skip over quite a few things and let me run through this as best I can. And I'm going to, so this one, it, it just shows the toolbar and all the selection. You have all the sensors out there, you know, the alerts on there. And then um, we have just a, a localized region. And then it also gives you alerts out there, traffic conditions, travel times. Uh, let's see, this is construction zones out there and all, all our traffic um, cameras and that. So I'm actually going to skip over the entire lesson three just so I can get to my last section. So what I'm learning with doing this class is that uh, it takes a little bit more time to do this online than it does if I'm standing in front of you and talking you through. So I'm real sorry about that. So I hope this is a good way to do this. So let me get to my safety side. Yeah, I don't know if you play this in slow motion out there, you'll be able to see everything. So I'm guessing there's another 45 minutes of information in here um, that I'm not going to be able to cover. So the last 45 minutes or so, I can do the safety operations and that, which I think is very important for everyone out there because we all want to go home in one piece out there. We want to see the traveling public go home. The managers and that want to see our equipment, you know, stay up and running for the entire snow and ice event. They want to keep the cost now. They don't want to have some major accident or incident happen out there that makes our equipment down. A big thing out there is we need to be familiar with the operation of the equipment we're using. If we're not, find someone that understands, you know, how to operate it. One of our stories is when the wing plows first came in, it was basically go out on the road and use them. And we were tearing the wing plows off the trucks. They didn't realize we had to drop them down to the ground at a very slow speed, if not stop, because there was a tendency for the point of the plow to hit into the pavement and it would catch and throw that blade up into the passenger side of the truck. And we ruined a number of passenger doors and rear view mirrors until people caught on to that. Another thing is it sticks out six foot off the right hand side of the truck. And we have people clipping guardrail and mailboxes out there. You know, we have one story in a county where a, a spare guy came in, told to go run a route, came back in, told the boss, hey, I don't, there's a wing plow. I don't know how to run it. You'll be fine. Go run it. Boss was waiting for him when he came into the garage and had words with him because he had taken out every single mailbox on the route. They had to go out and replace them all. So again, be familiar with the operation of the equipment you're using. Circle of safety. 
you know, we're required when out of sight of the equipment to do a circle of safety. What a circle of safety is, we walk around the equipment making sure we don't have any new situations around the equipment. That's a safety factor. It could be a blown hydraulic line. You know, our mechanics get in equipment. Uh, it, we have a pony that runs at noon and they get a piece that they have to put on your truck. They may be under your truck working on it. It's not a good idea to hop in and drive off with them working on it. You know, we had one guy back into a supervisor's pickup truck. He parked it in the blind spot of the truck. Guy hops in, backs out of the stall, and backs over the the manager's pickup truck. Seatbelt. You know, common sense. We got to wear our seatbelts out doing snow and ice operations. You know, one of our stories, uh, we had a guy driving a truck. He hit a snow drift. Next thing you know, he was in the passenger seat. Just that quick. You know, took him right out from behind the, the steering wheel. Another guy I went to truck and loader with back in 1986, he's down in southeast Ohio. And they said they got hills down there. Well, I'm from Flatland over in Dark County. We're farming country. And they took me down there to show me the hills he was on. And they're mountains to me. It's like, wow, you have to hold on to the dash of the pickup truck. Felt like you were going to fall right out of your out of your seat. Well, this guy going up a hill, didn't have guardrail on it. State route in that. And the truck slid out from under him, went over the side of the hill, rolled over three times. You know, he said, I'm lucky if it rolled one more time, it was a 100-foot drop off. You know, he's real glad he had a seatbelt on. He said he wished he tied down his thermos and his lunch bucket because it hit him three times as it rolled around. You know, we're supposed to keep stuff secured in our cab. The good old days, we used to keep our tow chains, our log chains in the, the well of our passenger seat. Can you imagine getting hit up, getting hit upside of the head with that? Wow. You know, we got toolboxes on the outside of our equipment to put those in. So three points of contact, slips and falls, you know, big issue. Number one uh, injury in that out there, uh, Bureau of Workers' Comp and that, keep the statistics in that. We got to use three points of contact. What that means is both hands and then one foot as you move around. Make sure that all your footholds are solid. If you're moving around a truck that's covered in snow, make sure you clear the snow off. Make sure you have a solid footstep there. Hydraulic lines, you know, we're not engineered to work on hydraulic fluid. You know, use a stick, clipboard, something like that to move them around if you're looking for leaks, because if it's injected into your body, it can be fatal. You know, there's been two ODOT employees, both of them mechanics, that had either hydraulic fluid or grease injected into their hands. The one mechanic was greased in the truck, the side of the grease gun let go, the hose injected his hand full of grease. He thought it was funny. He was walking around the garage, squeezing it like a zit, squeezing uh, grease out of his hand. He didn't think it was funny when uh, blood poisoning set in. The doctors were saying, well, we're going to have to start taking off, you know, your hand and then work our way up as the blood poisoning goes. You know, they managed to save, a, save his hand and everything. But you got to have this stuff removed surgically if it's ever injected into, and it has to be done immediately. The other mechanic was working under the bed of a dump truck. You know, they had it propped up working on the hydraulic lines, had a line under pressure. It uh, had a pinhole leak injected into his hand, and he had it removed immediately. He didn't have the problems with blood poisoning and that that the other mechanic did. So auger jams, you know, we're going to have them. You know, one night I had like four or five of these. I had hot mix. I had a railroad spike stuck in my auger. You know, and with the old style spinner boxes, you had to open the tailgate up, dump out the salt out, and then dig your way down through the uh, salt piled up over the auger to clean it out. And then we all had a, a bar, uh, like a round piece of re-rod, that we uh, had holes in our augers that we had to manually back them up to try to get the chunk out, then fire everything up again to make sure it worked again before we closed everything up and then scraped the salt off the road when we went on down the road. But we've had people get their hands and feet stuck in augers. You know, they feel like they can use use their foot to kick a piece out of the uh, auger and they left the thing on and they pulled their feet into it. You know, we had one guy that was stuck for over an hour out on the roadway. And again, it was one of those country uh, routes where nobody comes through and he got his car hearts spun up in the auger and he finally flaked somebody down and they helped get him out. So be aware where those, uh, you know, pinch points, the auger jams and that are, 
and you don't want to get your hands in that. We're not allowed to climb down into a hopper bed out on the roadway. We have to have a second person there watching us and assisting, assisting us if we have issues in the hoppers because we've had people get hurt down in the auger or in the hopper and no one was there to assist them. Pinch points. So this is a new one for us. Um, you know, we're aware of pinch points, tailgates and plows and that, but that decal on the right, this is the second year they've been on our dump trucks uh, because we had an employee lose a finger. They were doing a slide in or an insert hopper into a tandem and the legs pop up and not for sure what all was going on. It's a team uh, project to get one of these hoppers in. And when those legs kicked up, it took a finger off. So we had to go back through and put pinch points on all our equipment. We had to evaluate where it needed to go on that and put these pinch point decals on. So believe it or not, that is a safety device. That's a garage door opener. And District 7, uh, the uh, head mechanic, Dwayne, and then the safety department got together and said, this is a safety device. Because again, slips and falls are your number one cause of injuries. So if you have a door opener, you don't have to get out of your truck, walk inside, hit the button, walk back out to your truck, get in, Walk in, you know, pull inside, get out, go turn, uh, go drop the door, and then go on your business. So it reduces the risk of slips and falls. It's a great safety item, great idea. You know, we got our loaders, we've got our pickup trucks. I think about everybody in the county garages, you know, have the remote. So it saves them, uh, reduces their risk of injury. So truck loading with a loader. You know, we don't want to ram our loaders and that into the trucks. You know, we don't uh, load over the operators and that. We don't overload the trucks. I mean, uh, one of the good old stories is the cleanest spot in the garages was the first turn going outside of the county garage, because that's where all the salt rolled off the sides of the truck. You had it so overloaded. You know, with the scales on our new loaders and that, uh, they, they don't overload the trucks. They know what their limits are. No, we haven't broken any springs on our uh, rear axles since they put the scales and that on, beefed up our trucks and that. So again, we don't overload. You know, we keep those buckets low, so we uh, reduce the risk of rollover. We don't put the buckets over the cab of the truck. Again, we have the driver there. We don't want to injure our drivers. Look before backing. Be very careful with floaters when it comes to backing. You look over one shoulder. You know, you have a blind spot on the opposite side. You got to look over both shoulders. You know, we had one of our uh, supervisors about get ran over. The guy was mixing grits at that time, and he was just uh, ramming and jamming. You know, put it in forward, put it in reverse, and hit the pedal. And he didn't see the supervisor coming up. Almost got him. Be careful when you're going into stockpiles and that. Uh, you know, we've had more than one person punch holes in our salt bins. You know, we've had people back up and they hit the sides of the salt bins or they have the, the cement pillars that protect the salt bin. They've hit those. So, you know, be real careful when you're operating uh, your loaders and that. Don't get into things. Oh, crab walking. I don't know if any of you are familiar of how to crab walk a loader. But a lot of times we get a loader stuck up against the wall of a salt bin. It's like, how do you get out? Uh, we teach everybody to crab walk. You can take the front bucket, push it down into the uh, the pavement, and it'll pick the front wheels off the ground. You may have to roll the bucket a little bit forward. You pick the front axle up. You, you articulate away, crab walk. Do that once or twice, and it usually gives you enough wiggle room you can get out of the situation. You know, it's kind of embarrassing to have to go into the shop and say, hey, I got the loader stuck in the salt bin. What do I do? So some common accidents involving CDL vehicles out there. You know, unassured clear distance, hitting the vehicle ahead. Nine times out of a 10, it is the vehicle ahead that is just taking your spot. You're maintaining, you know, four or five seconds of distance between the vehicle ahead of you. You got somebody that just has to take that spot. But then they slam on the brakes and they can't figure out why you're setting on top of them. You know, the best thing we can do is just keep giving that space. 
you know, hope we don't get into a bad situation. A lot of companies now have cameras in their trucks so that if an accident happens, they can show what happened with the accident. And, and if they can prove it's the guy in front, they get the ticket and they pay the bill. You know, I used to drive tour buses and all our tour buses had to have these cameras in because the insurance company was getting tired of somebody taking our space and us hitting them. We'd have 55 cases of, of whiplash in the back. So if they could prove it was the guy in front, they paid the insurance bill. Blind spots. Be aware of where your blind spots are on your trucks. Again, people, I don't know what it is to get up close to our plows and get into our blind spots. And it's like, people, what are you doing? So what we got to do is, you know, we got to check our blind spots. You know, directly behind us, I've seen we now have rear aim cameras that let us know what's directly behind us. They've got sensors on equipment that'll let us know we got vehicles on each side of the, of the trucks. So, I mean, technology is improving, but be aware of where those blind spots are. You know, perfect world situation is we don't have anyone around us while we're plowing snow. You know, we need our space to operate. You know, we get into a bad situation, we need room to maneuver. Intersections. Number one area for accidents. Uh, they're saying in cities, it is 40% of the cause of accidents, areas for accidents. Out in the country is 50% of, of the accidents. So were those accidents occurring? Uh, Right-hand turns, you know, if the bigger uh, CDL vehicles, they take a little bit more room to do that right turn as someone gets in on your right-hand side. You know, left turns, I don't know if you've seen, they've got dedicated left-hand turn lanes now and left turn signals. You know, they they found out down in Florida, they got a lot of retirees here, and they learned that as we get older, our reaction time slow down. So they found that these folks were not able to get a left turn in uh, without getting into an accident. Oncoming traffic would get into them, or by the time the light was changing to yellow and then to red, they were then starting to react and make the left-hand turn. So they now have dedicated left-hand turns. And then like UPS, you're not allowed to turn left at an intersection. You have to turn right to go left. You go up one block, turn right, up one block, turn right, up one block, turn right, straight through the intersection. So you have a low risk of having a left-hand turn accident. They're also noting that People aren't paying attention when they come to a stop sign that it's only a two-way stop and not a four-way stop. They think the other traffic stops and pulls right out in front of the other vehicles. Red light runs is still an issue. You know, if you set in an intersection, your light turns red, you count three, the majority of red light runs occur during that first three seconds. So if you delay your move by three seconds, you've reduced your risk tremendously in having a red light run. The other thing with CDL vehicles, you know we don't stop on a dime. So if that light changes too fast, we might be the guy coming through the intersection. So sometimes it happens. It's like, what else do you do? Backing. Backing is still the number one accident out there. You know, No matter what we try to do to reduce the risk, try to prevent backing, it still seems to be that number one thing. You know, I talked already about having backing cameras in there, all these sensors on the units. You know, what can we do? Be aware the backing's a big issue. If we can park in a pull through where we don't have to back out, that saves you. If you back into a parking spot rather than pull in so you don't have to back out, that reduces your risk of having an accident out there. Having a spotter to back you in. I've heard of some agencies, they mandate that you have to have a spotter before you back to make sure you don't back into anything. And then before you back into a space, Check it out. If you have to get out and look around, make sure you don't have one of those pesky little cement poles that seem to be right out of your line of sight in these rear view mirrors and you back into one. So be real careful when backing. Oh, I was going to mention, it, can I go back? I can go back. This accident slide, uh, that's ice on the roadway. And the gentleman lost it on the roadway and rolled the truck over. Beds up, so we have a high center of gravity. And you can see the side ditches are low. 
I thought the first time I saw this, the guy dropped it off the edge of the roadway, overcorrected. And it's usually you overcorrect, then you have to overcorrect because you overcorrected and you roll the truck over. So what do we do if we drop a wheel off the road? You lock your hands on the steering wheel and you either slow down or you nudge the vehicle up onto the roadway. So uh, you have to be careful. You have to have your plan B already in mind on what you're going to do if you get into a situation. So you don't do the knee jerk reaction and then put yourself into a situation like this, roll in a truck over. So this one, they're telling me it was a brand new truck. Uh, the guy was a brand new employee and he had to have the latest uh, and greatest truck. The uh, supervisor said, go grab a truck, go out on the road. He went out on the road and uh, promptly wrecked. He rolled it over out on the roadway and ruined the perfectly good truck. And again, it's just inexperience out there. Something got away from him and over he went. So this one is interstate, four lane. They are telling me the driver was impaired at this point. The other thing is, is when we're going down the road, you know, 40 mile an hour, if we're lucky on the interstate, 20 mile an hour or slower on these uh, rural routes, rural state routes and that. And you got somebody doing 70 mile an hour, no matter what the road conditions are. So, and you can see the backside of this truck. This is an earlier um, one of our trucks and we have the salt brine tank on the back. We have all this grime across the back. So you really can't see the backside of our trucks too well at that point. So, and this guy did survive the accident. He was under the influence. And you've heard the stories where when they're under the influence, they seem to survive the wrecks. You know, it's pretty loose when he hit the thing and he survived fine. This one, you know, somebody gave someone a free load of salt. Thankfully, there were no kids living or playing on the uh, swing sets at the time this happened. What you don't see is there's a big sweeping curve. And the gentleman was driving too fast for the road conditions, went off the right-hand side of the road, and promptly rolled the truck over. So again, know your limits when it comes to going around curves. If there's a posted warning sign, those are set up for vehicles, uh, for cars. They aren't set up for trucks. Recommend you go five mile an hour slower than that posted warning uh, to give you less risk of rollover going around the curve. Okay, and this is us cleaning out. We think they were cleaning out the gore here. Again, we got to get all the snow out of there so it doesn't melt and run across the roadway in that. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to see a windrow. And this person, again, we got uh, several trucks here cleaning out. And, you know, we might have been just starting up again and going. And this guy, you know, off the ramp, 70 mile an hour and bang, right into the back of our truck. You know, we thought he might have lost it on the windrow, got over there and uh, lost it and got in there. And how about the Yahoos that are doing 70 mile an hour in the hammer lane? They say, oh, this is my exit. We can go across three to four lanes to go right off the exit and right into the back of one of our trucks. So hey, just something else. We can't do much to prevent that. We keep trying to do public uh, awareness. We'll see a slide here coming up on public awareness. So let's see, a fatal crash. Again, this is the hammer lane. Driver did survive this one. And, you know, it's the closure rate, 70 mile an hour versus 40 mile an hour, right up into our rear end. So another fatality, gentleman lost control of the vehicle and went sideways into the back of one of our insert hoppers. And you can see that the back of the insert hopper halfway through the vehicle. You know, our vehicles, they usually protect us out there. You know, it's real nice. That, I mean, they're beefed up and everything. So we feel comfortable, you know, driving the snow and ice equipment because they'll protect us. So one of the things we're doing is we're trying to be more visible out there. This program was started a couple of years ago when Allen County uh, garage had three of their snow and ice trucks hit in a matter of two weeks. You know, semis blew two of them clean out of the uh, off the interstate. The third one, I don't know what the story was on that. 
You know, I saw one picture where a tandem axle truck was hit by a semi and blown all the way off the right of way. The semi rolled over further out into the farmer's field. And then the other one, they're telling me that a semi, you know how we uh, throw the rooster tail off, we get the powdery stuff, and it just totally obliterates the backside of the truck. Lost it in that um, plume of snow on that, and the semi ran right into that and right into the back of our dump truck. So there's studies out there that show that green shows up better in snow conditions. So we've got these retro reflective panels that we retrofitted to all our equipment. We also went to a three color LED lighting system. You can see the two flashers on the back of the bed as well as on the front of the bed and then the two on top of the truck. And again, it's white, green, yellow that they strobe all LED and it works out real good for us. I mean, we're hearing a reduction in accidents. The other thing we're doing is public awareness out there. Don't crowd the plow. And this one's Iowa DOT. If you go to the uh, Clear Roads group, they actually have a, a page dedicated to these graphics. And you can download the graphics and Photoshop in your company's, uh, your department's name and that and information in and put this out as a public awareness. And it covers a lot of the things I've already talked about, blind spots, you know, giving them room, you know, don't, uh, you know, get close to a plow, you know, give us all the room we need to get our jobs done. And again, hopefully we can educate the general public to respect us and to go slow out there on the roadways. So some things we need to be aware of out there, you know, driving, we get into a skid, what are we going to do? You know, drop the bed. That's one of the first things I was told is always have my hand on the bed down button because if we get loose out there on the roadway, that high center of gravity will, will roll us over. Slow down as best as you can. Turn into the skid, you know, or look to where you want to go and your hands will naturally turn into that. When we're driving, we're supposed to use the eight and four position on the steering wheel because we got airbags in our trucks now, right? We used to be up at the 10 and two and when we had our hands up there, and if we have an airbag go off, it can break our arms. It blows our hands right off the uh, um, steering wheel. Now, I know with snow and ice, almost every one of us will drive in the 9 o'clock position with our left hand, our right hand's on the controls. You know, I drove 30 years, and that's the way I drove. So when we're not doing snow and ice, don't have to have that hand over there on the control. Try to remember that 8 and 4 position. We're supposed to push and pull. As we go through our turns in that, we have to go through turns slower, which should reduce the risk of us having an accident during turns. Keep an eye on what's going on around you. Get the big picture going on around you. So, you know, you know what your uh, circle of safety is, what your uh, cushion of safety, I'm sorry, the where everything around you, it, what's going on, make sure you don't have vehicles here. If you can do that, I know with high volume traffic, that doesn't always work, but you want to know what's going on around. You want to see what's going on a couple of blocks ahead of you in town, as far as the eye can see out in the country. You know, keep your eyes moving. Don't get tunnel vision. You know, you can uh, go into a trance if all you do is stare one way or one direction out there on the roadway. Keep your eyes moving. You know, have your plan B's, leave yourself an out. What are you going to do if? What are you going to do if you drop a wheel off the roadway? What are you going to do if somebody comes left to center? You know, one of our, our stories is we had somebody, uh, general public go left to center. Our, our truck operator reacted to it. He went left to center to avoid the accident. The general public recovered and we hit him head on. It was our fault. You know, what should he have done? You know, he should have slowed down going off to the right-hand side of the road as best he can, you know, and prepare for impact. That's the most you could do. But you don't want to set yourself up for being the cause of the accident. So let's see, right yield, changing lanes. So these are just some high-risk areas uh, for accidents. When Anytime you change lanes, change directions and that, you're at a higher risk of getting into an accident. So be aware of that. Again, make sure they see you by using your turn signals. Let folks know where you're going. And again, be tolerant of the general public in that. You know, a lot of them like to wave at us with one finger. 
Be nice, smile, and wave with all your fingers when you wave back at them. So, injuries and accidents, what are you fo Yeah, I can't ask you that. So, anyway, this is usually the discussion part where I ask you folks if you've seen anything going on. Uh, the photo here is supposed to have happened somewhere in the state of Ohio. Uh, when I was in, I think it was Knox County, the guy, oh yeah, it was a county over here. And the frame that holds the uh, plow and the wing plow on and that, all the bolts came loose. And of course, it has a gravel road. It dug into the gravel road and flipped it right under the truck. So not for sure how they got that apart, if they had to take a crane in there to lift it off and that. But that would be an eye-opening experience, wouldn't it? So again, for us out there, for accident causes, you know, for us, fatigue is a big issue. ODOT found out that after three 16-hour shifts, our accident rates tripled. So we've gone to trying to go to like one 16-hour shift and then transitioning to 12-hour shifts. So people have time off. You know, we get back-to-back -back shifts. Uh, you know, we end up fatiguing on that and we have that higher risk of an accident. You know, the stress is associated with going out there on the roadway for snow and ice, or maybe some stressors at home. You know, I've talked about, you know, the faster we go, the higher the risk we have of having an accident in a snowplow. So going too fast. You know, traffic volume out there. Here in Columbus, when I was plowing, I was told to be off the road at 6.30 in the morning because rush hour started. And it didn't do any good for us to get stuck in a, traffic jam out there and then the guy that came on duty at 7 30 wanted his truck to go out on his route so be aware of what your traffic flow is it might be real nice you know for a few minutes and all of a sudden you got wall-to-wall -wall cars you know i've seen on uh, the interstate system in 10 minutes go from having a couple of cars here and then it's just wall-to-wall -wall cars just amazing you know and then weather again you got the roads wet and all of a sudden you have a squall come through and all of a sudden it has solution dilution and you have refreeze. So be aware things can happen with the weather. It can change hourly on us out there. So other factors. So our effects are prolonged out there. I've talked about this where we get fatigued, we get fuzzy brain. You know, we can't focus on what we're doing. We start taking shortcuts to get things done. That that sets us up for having an accident or an injury. You know, we're just not getting the rest. You know, I was talking about us working 16 hour shifts out there. And they were finding out people would have to go home. And some of these guys were spending an hour and a half just to drive home and then an hour and a half to drive back to the shop. So out of eight hours off, they've lost three hours to drive. They get home, I don't know about you guys, but I'm wired after plowing snow. I might be up another hour or two, you know, just to settle down when I get home. And then you got to deal with the chores at home. You have to get things uh, settled in. Some of these guys are saying they're lucky to get a two hour nap on their couch before they get up and come back to work. And I've seen people come into work with the same clothes they had when they went home. So again, that fatigue and that, they aren't getting the rest they need. So and again, tempers will flare. You know, you're just not, you know, getting the rest you want. So number one cause of accidents out there with everyone is uh, the general public distracted driving. They do everything but drive. You know, I've heard stories where the younger generation were brought up with, uh, you know, handheld devices. So that comes first rather than driving. So be real careful of that. You know, make sure you're not one of the statistics. You know, make sure you're not eating and driving, going down the road, that you're distracted by drinking all the time. You know, you may have to get a sip every now and then going down the road, but be careful of those things. And if you see other people that are doing that, stay away from them. You know, give them clear room. So, and here's a study that was done. Carnegie Mellon did this, and they showed by using a mobile device, and it didn't matter what type mobile device you used, but it's, um, where's the percentage? 37% of your brain activity is uh, engaged in that mobile use and taken away from driving. So, and it, it's the same as being under the influence of an alcoholic beverage. So that's why they're telling you to put the cell phones down while driving out there. 
CDO vehicles, I think we have to have hands-free. And I know some companies actually ban the outright use of cell phones in operating CDO vehicles. So multitasking. So as a human, we can do four things maximum. You know, in a snowplow, we, we pretty much are maxed out at four. We try to do a fifth thing, then something will get dropped. One of, something else will go away. Seems to be the driving that goes away when you're in a vehicle. So keep that in mind. Don't overload yourself with duties in a truck to the point that you can't stay focused on driving. So studies out there show us that there's a thousand distracted accidents per day here in the country. There are 10 distracted fatalities per day in this country. They've added 6,227 pedestrians killed on US roads in 2018 because they're these walking zombies. You know, they just walk right out in front of oncoming traffic and get hit. You know, it's like, what do you do? You know, you can blow a horn at them or something, but for us, what else do you do? You gotta just try to general, um, try to educate the general population and hope they get the picture before they get hit by someone. So some things out there on the roadway, you know, I've had some laughs in that by the folks that work in the city because they're only a few minutes away from their uh, workstation. But with us, we've had people stuck out on the roadway before. You know, we, it could be a few hours. We had three guys in our county, Dark County. During the blizzard, they were stuck out on the road for three days. Three, three trucks triple heading, and they got in behind some guardrail, and they sat in their trucks until the wind died down enough that they could see a farmhouse not too far away. And they walked to the farmhouse and stayed there for three days. So when we get in our trucks, you know, we should have enough clothing, enough warm clothing that we can get out of the trucks. You know, we may get stuck. You know, our policy is we got to dig ourselves out if we can, make sure we're really stuck before we call for another dump truck to come pull us out. And hopefully we don't have to have a tow truck come get us out. So again, have all your cold weather gear. Nowadays with cell phones, it's nice to have those so you can call for help rather than get on the truck radio. And even with the new Mark systems, there's still some dead spots out there in the state. So the radios aren't the most reliable thing. They're better than what they used to be. You know, and having your snacks and that in the vehicle. So if you get hungry or need something to drink, you've got it there. And, you know, most of our equipment has flashlights in it. If you don't, it's a good idea. Walmart, they got $1 flashlights. I buy two or three so I can lose one and still have one left to use out on the roadway. And then they recommended we have candles in our trucks. So if we do get trapped out there, we had one guy, the engine uh, died on us and he was stuck in his truck. So how does he stay warm? You know, a candle will give you up to 10 degrees uh, warmth to whatever the ambient temperature is out there. You know, we took an old first aid kit and threw candles and matches. Learned real quick I needed to go to liquid or what the liquid paraffin candles because I used the wax candles. And when I checked on it in the fall, the wax candles had melted during the summer. So two different forms of lighting the candles, a lighter and matches. Lighters don't always work out there. And then uh, we have space blankets in our first aid kit. You know, a lot of people say it's for shock. Well, that's true, but it's also to keep us warm in case we get stranded out on the roadway. So if you break down out there, we try to get the trucks off the road as best we can. It does noise happen. You know, one of our stories in our county, we had a uh, one of our first diesel trucks. They were known for dropping valves, and this guy was in the bottom of it, a hill in the middle of a curve, and the truck dropped the valve. You can't go anywhere. You know, air brakes are on it. You know, once the air is bled off, you don't have brakes. So we ended up having to go out there and work and blowing snow on that. And again, you come down the hill, go around the curve, come up a hill. So we have flaggers at the top of each side of the hill trying to get traffic slowed down. And we're down at the bottom. We ended up having to take uh, a plug out of the air tank, put a uh, tire valve into there. We we fitted something we could put into all our air tanks. And the mechanics put air into the tank, released the parking brake, hooked a chain to it. Thankfully, it was one of our older uh, manual transmission trucks. And we were able to drag it back to the shop. We'd have to stop every few miles to top off the air pressure and keep on going. 
but uh, you know it isn't a perfect world out there and when we do break down you know do what you can you got to let the garage know to have somebody come get you or get the truck off the road you got to set your triangles out within 10 minutes of breaking down you know be as visible as you can and you still have your electrical system floorways uh, strobe lights if you got road flares throw those out there so you know one of the hot topics we had during one of our classes was hooking to non-department -de vehicles back in the good old days we used to have frames under these vehicles you know we have a farmer stuck out um, in no man's land we'd hook to him yank him out of the ditch and go on our merry way then these unibodies came along next thing you know you know we're ripping off uh, wheels fenders everything we're not allowed to touch it. The only time I've ever seen us touch another vehicle under law enforcement orders. We had a highway patrolman that was uh, dealing with a broken down vehicle at the other end of a area. We were pushing back drifts with a loader. And I was a cleanup guy in the truck. Watched the highway patrol come up and say a few things to the loader. Off the loader goes. Next thing you know, there's a car in the loader bucket. Pushes it off into the uh, farm field that I was right by. I ended up having to haul the passenger or the driver of that car to a shelter because we had shelters set up at all the fire departments because it was such a bad storm. So that's the only time I've ever seen us move a uh, non-department vehicle uh, since this policy went out. Accidents. You know, what should you do if you're involved in an accident in that? You call for help. You know, call the garage, especially if you're involved. You know, you have cell phones, you can call 911. You know, does the snowplow stay at the scene or not? You know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you usually stay at the scene. Like here in Columbus, we go on. We're a secondary hazard. Everybody sees an ODOT vehicle as a target. You know, okay, let's see how many points I can get for hitting this ODOT vehicle. I, we move on. So, you know, secure the scene if you're staying. Make sure it's safe to work in and that. You know, render aid to what your level of training is. You know, everybody should be trained in uh, basic first aid and that. So don't start MacGyvering first aid out there. You know, you can be held liable if you do something that's wrong. You know, if you have other people that can render aid, do traffic control, you know, and then get out of the way once that time comes. You know, if you're involved, we spent a half hour in class talking about this one subject. If you're involved, do not talk about it. We had a guy that was involved in an accident in one of these townships or counties out there. And this guy was cleaning out an intersection, backed up into another vehicle. He pops out of his vehicle and says, oh, my God, it's my phone. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. It melts all over the other folk. What did he just do? He just announced liability for the accident and all damages involved. Don't do that. Let the investigators show up, do their investigation, and let them decide. You know, I've seen accidents where law enforcement say it was uh, a weather-related accident is no fault, and you're gone. You know, don't talk about it. And make sure you cooperate with law enforcement. One of our stories is someplace out there, city, township, wherever it was, they, they told everybody, do not talk to anyone if you're involved in an accident. This guy, law enforcement walked up to the truck, and the guy, the operator rolled the window and said, I'm not allowed to talk to you. Rolled his window right back up. You know, the cop didn't know what to do. He ended up, he knew it was a town, so he knew the boss, called the boss, the boss come out and said, you're allowed to talk to the law enforcement officer. <laughs> so cooperate with them. So anyway, yeah, if you folks got questions in that, keep sending them out here. Yeah, because I'm getting real close to the end of the class. I'm right in the last couple of slides here. So again, uh, we have different law enforcement agencies doing investigation. I've had highway patrol, Dark County Sheriff's Department, as well as uh, City Union City Police came out and did the investigation when we popped the manhole cover off. So, you know, cooperate with all of them. You don't know who's going to do the investigation. Make sure you guys got proof of insurance. Somewhere out there, some attorney realized we did not have proof of insurance cards in our ODOT vehicles. And they took that to the bank. And we now have in proof of insurance. Every year they print it off for every specific vehicle in our fleet. Drug testing. Again, we're required to go in for drug testing. You know, this is ODOT's policy. I've had other garages say we go in immediately. You know, it doesn't matter if we're involved, we're not involved. Because again, two years down the line, we may have a lawsuit. So we want all our information now ready just in case we have that. So, you know, big thing is it has to be done within 32 hours. 
You know, if it's alcohol, it should be done within eight hours, but make sure you have a good uh, reason if it isn't done. You know, we had an accident in our county. You couldn't get to the drug testing place. It was closed due to bad weather. That's a good reason. So let's see, and why did I skip? Okay, there it is. So that's it. With So I'm done with the class now, covered an awful lot of information. So we've got about six minutes left in this class. You know, I usually would pass out evaluations and that at this time. Oh, but I do want to give you sources. That's right, I have to give all the credits. LTAP offers this online learning class on snow and ice, and I hope you can see all this. But this class takes about 30 hours to go through all the different uh, sections, and it has a lot more detail, like how to set up level of service. You know, it, it goes into more detail on what happens if you shut down the interstate or the systems and how much it'll cost uh, the state and areas. It goes through most of the states on cost and that. So it's a lot of really, really good information in this class. Definitely recommend if you have the time to go through and take this class. Okay, is there a role? Okay, and yes, there is. Uh, I'll get to it here in a second. And then Iowa DOT, uh, their videos, this is the link that I found for it. It was a 15 part series. I think it's shorter than that now maybe a couple of hours instead of 15 hours worth of videos. Well worth your time to look at those. You can use them for safety meetings and that out there. You can pick which segment you want to look at. Or if you're trying to learn something uh, about snow and ice in a particular field, you might find the specific videos in that. So Clear Roads, Scott Lucas is our contact here at ODOT for Clear Roads. And this is his information uh, here. You know, real good guy to talk to. He's very busy. Sometimes he doesn't return the calls net in a timely manner. So Clear Roads Acknowledgements. Again, I pulled slides off of the uh, Clear Roads uh, training modules, and Jim and Ann did that work, and I want to make sure they get proper credit for that. And then Dwayne Byers. Here's your person to contact for more information on roll-off truck equipment. I think Dwayne will help you out. He's very knowledgeable. He's very well respected at District 7 as well as Columbus for his abilities out there on equipment management. And he has an open door policy. That's his phone number there, 937-497-6840. So you can give him a call and he may not return the call right away, but he can fill you in on roll off truck equipment and even Jim Church, back there with the co-op program that you can buy ODOT equipment from, uh, that should be your information. So, and I'm just gonna look here as to what my questions are. I'm getting a screen pop up, so, and that's Paula doing that, okay. So that's really it on my part. So we still have a few minutes for questions, and there's my contact. Yes, I do follow up uh, questions. If you want to contact me with questions, please do so. Feel free. That's my current email address, my cell number there. You know, if you don't ask me, ask LTAP. I'm more than willing to go out there and find information. I actually added uh, a module on snow fences and that to the six hour version of this, the road scholarship version of snow and ice operations because somebody asked about it at one of the uh, classes I presented. I thought it was a good thing to put into the class. I just don't have the time for this three hour circuit rider class to do that. These links down here all have to deal with cul-de-sacs. That seemed to be the hot topic in a number of other different um, classes that I've done. So I like the solution one municipality did. They said, we contract it all out. You know, we, we have all these landscaping companies and they have small snow plows. We just contracted our cul-de-sacs and that out. And that was their solution to it. So I really hope everybody's ready for this snow and ice season. We'll have to see the farmer's almanac, I think was calling for a little bit more weather than what we've had in the past. We definitely haven't had the weather we've had in the past. I mean, I remember plowing snow that the plow, the snow was coming over the top of the plows and that. So, folks, I hope everybody's careful out there with what you do with snow and ice and be safe out there. So I'm going to turn this back over to Paula to do end credits or anything. 
and then we're going to be off the air here in about a minute. So Paula? All right, we do not have any other questions. Um, certificates will be sent out um, within a few days. I did see that. Uh, we got a lot of thank yous in, in the questions pod for you here, Ron. Um, again, you'll receive an email from the LTAP office once this video is finished processing with um, a link to this and all the documents provided by Ron. Also, again, certificates will come from our office. Just allow a few days for us to get those issued. We're gonna verify attendance. It was taken automatically when you signed in today, so there's nothing additional that you need to do. Thank you so much for your time, and Ron, thank you so much for your information presented today. Well, my pleasure, and look forward to going out on the road again next year. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.